Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And today I'm going to make a few comments about the role of artificial intelligence in cardiovascular medicine. Before I do, it's useful to stop and think about the usual paradigm of disease and seeing a doctor. Normally you have someone who's living their life, they're doing well, when suddenly lightning may strike. They may develop signs or symptoms. Then you go to the doctor and tests are ordered and then based on those treatments are rendered. But there's a fundamental problem with that approach. The very first sign or symptom may be a heart attack. It might be a stroke. It could be sudden death. And we know that for decades before anyone has a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, there is disease in the artery, atherosclerosis, that leads up to that event. Now our body is giving off tiny signals all the time indicating its physiologic status in the form of heart rate, heart variability, electrocardiographic or electrical signals of the heart, changes in respiration. And if we have the ability to understand these subtle patterns and to process them, we may be able to identify a disease event that's about to happen or the presence of underlying undiagnosed illness. That's where artificial intelligence can play a role. And typically, the way artificial intelligence works is you have a large body of data and you use that to train a computer. So it's learning from the collected digital experience. I'll give one example. One of the challenges is identifying whether or not somebody has a weak heart pump. About 3% of all people will have this condition. It's called asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction and not be aware of it. And it's important to know because if you knew you had it, you could take medications or in some cases receive a device like a pacemaker defibrillator that can prevent the onset of symptoms, lower the risk of dying, and extend both length and quality of life. And so we hypothesized that if we exposed a computer, or in this case used a convolutional neural network, a form of machine learning or artificial intelligence, to tens of thousands of ECGs that were both normal or weak heart pump, that through sheer recognition it could learn the subtle patterns associated with weak heart pump. And by doing so, we found that that was exactly the case. So that after training the network, someone who's coming for a routine ECG, or someone who acquires an ECG from a wearable watch or from a smartphone electrode, could know in about 15 seconds whether or not that condition were present. So that is simply one example of how artificial intelligence will help us both identify otherwise hidden disease uh, and help us identify people who have impending disease or conditions. Now developing new AI tools requires several things. It requires subject matter experts, clinicians who understand the disease condition well. It requires engineers who speak Python and TensorFlow in the language of machine learning and it requires large, carefully curated data sets. We had to have the ECGs with labels to know if a specific ECG was associated with a weak heart pump or not to teach the computer. Uh, we're fortunate at Mayo Clinic to have very large volumes of data and we've established programs in which engineers are embedded side by side with our clinicians and it's that exchange of ideas and that open discussion that has really been driving innovation. And so engineers join clinicians on rounds or in procedures at pacemaker implantations, at echocardiograms and treadmill tests. And through the discussions that follow, why do you do things this way? Why not that way? And quite often the clinician will say, well, we've just always done it that way. That those conversations spark the, the new ideas that will drive artificial intelligence into the future. I'm often asked, will artificial intelligence replace doctors? And my answer is no. Um, on the other hand, what it will do is provide the tools that help us see disease, find disease, to prevent it and cure it. Think about this. If you go outside at night and it's dark, you bring a flashlight so you can see. And that flashlight isn't replacing your eyes, but it's extending your vision so you can see what's ahead and use your eyes more effectively. So our, our goal is to continue to develop these tools so that we can peer ahead and see the disease that's coming. Thank you for your attention.